So I wanted to get out for you uh, one of our manual wargaming kits that's in the museum collection. And this is a, uh, a kit that was uh, from 1963, and it all comes in this folder, as you can see, that uh, is meant to be very compact and portable. So this game that you're seeing the components of here uh, is based on the games that they played, the tactical level games that they played here at the college. But this particular game is actually meant to be sort of a component of um, something the college was doing a lot more in the post-war years, which is more distance learning education. And so what they did is they made up these wargaming kits to have uh, to provide to people out in the fleet. So instead of you having to come to Newport and be a student and spend a year here and play these war games, um, they also wanted people who were out you know, on a ship at sea to be able to war game too and, and to absorb some of the lessons that they were learning by playing these games. So they made up these kits that were meant to be sent out so you could play these just about anywhere, um, wherever you had space enough to set them up. Um, if you were on shore at a base somewhere, you could play these in the barracks, or, or if you were out of the ship, you know, you could set them up on the bridge or the wardroom or, or wherever there was room to do this. So um, it was just a way that the War College sort of made its presence and its influence felt throughout the whole fleet and not just for the students here. Great. So can you walk us through mm. kind of what this includes? Sure. So for this particular game, so this is from 1963, so it's very much uh, a product of the Cold War. The components are really not that different from some of the games from much earlier, from before World War II. Um, the rules, of course, have changed now, and they're much more, uh, you know, focused on things like aircraft, surface-to-surface -surface missiles, surface-to-air missiles, submarines. Um, those, those are all given a lot more attention <laughs> in, in the rulebook in games like this than they would have before. But the basic layout is very similar. Um, so in the, the primary rulebook here, um, um, so this is, you can see about how thick the rulebook are. It's, uh, there is, it's not uh, too terrible by <laughs> the standards of other games. You don't have like a dictionary size thing. It's, you know, something that's easy enough you could absorb in, in a day or two of reading and get the basic idea of how it works. Um, what is intended to happen is, um, ideally, this game is supposed to be played by two different teams. Um, just as in the pre-war years, they basically usually called them the red team and the blue team. Um, the blue team being the friendly side, the red team being the opponent's side, and of course in this era that's going to be the Soviet Union. Um, so however many people you had to play with, you usually have one person be kind of the overall person in charge, and then whatever size scenario this was, if you had squadrons of ships or, or individual ships, you might have your other players being in those subordinate positions. Each team uh, was divided into three components, the, the surface fleet, the, the aircraft, and then the submarine, the subsurface forces. And each of those teams was supposed to be in a separate room. Um, and the idea being that if you want to coordinate, come up with a plan for your side, if you're on a ship and you want to talk to the guy who's in the submarine below you who wants to torpedo the enemy ship, you can't just, in real life, pull him aside and say, hey, go after that guy. <laughs> You've got to uh, have a communication system in place. Uh, you know, if it, you can radio an aircraft, you can do other things. But, but it's meant to simulate kind of those real-world difficulties. So the teams would be kind of divided into those three components and, and ideally put in separate rooms. And each team would have a plotting chart, which you're seeing here. This is kind of the main plane surface for each team. And it's obviously, it's, it's nothing very complicated. It's just a big grid for the most part. Um, the grid is divided, you can see, into numbers to make grid coordinates very easy. So when you're plotting a ship and you're doing your move, you can say that you're moving from a certain grid position to another grid position. And then it's very easy to show that. Um, if this scenario was one that was taking place by land, if there were land features and geography coming into play, they, would, they could just draw that on this very easily. They might use a plastic overlay so they didn't have to draw right on the map. Um, there are any number of ways to show that. Uh, the most important facet, I think, of this is that this game is meant to be run by umpires. Um, it's not a case where the two teams are sitting across from each other playing sort of like a traditional board game. They're off in a separate room, and as they do their moves, the umpires and the control group that's actually running the game 
uh, is, is plotting both sides' moves on a master plot board that basically is a bigger version of this. Um, it might take up you know, the better section of the whole floor. But they would be tracking both teams' movements throughout the game. And, and that's how you bring in fog of war to, to these games. Um, they would not, if, if you're on one side and your ships are out of range of the other sides, you're not going to know that they're there in real life unless you've detected them somehow, either visually or through radar or any other means you have. So in the game, um, if your ships are too far away to see the enemy's ships, um, you don't get the perfect God's eye view of the battle. You only see what the umpires tell you that you can see. And so they're tracking that on their plot board. Then they'll come into the room and tell you, okay, you see, you know, two destroyers on the horizon, or, or you see on your radar, there's a radar signature of an incoming aircraft, something like that. So that's how they, they try to make it, uh, again, kind of real world conditions as much as they can within the limits of a, of a physical game and one that isn't computerized, of course. So, um, so the, uh, they have the teams in the separate rooms. The umpires are in the middle. Um, these games are played, um, I would say, much more loosely than we might be used to playing if you're sitting down playing a game with friends or something like that. They're played in turns, but the turns are scalable. So, for example, um, it's up to the umpire to decide, or the game controller, or game director, they might call them, how, much, uh, how long each turn is. So in the beginning, um, when presumably both sides are going to be kind of far apart and they're supposed to meet somewhere, you know, in, in the middle, the first turn might be two hours, three hours, four hours of, of game time. Once the fleets are in range of each other and once where they're within range to start shooting at each other, they're going to scale that down. And they might say, OK, the next turn is just three minutes or one minute or 30 seconds, you know, plot a move for 30 seconds and turn that in. Um, so that's, that's how they, otherwise you're going to spend a lot of time, you know, just having the fleets kind of close to each other. So, so that's how they work around that. Um, and then most times these, these turns are timed themselves. So the umpires might say to the team, okay, you've got, you know, two minutes to write an order and figure out what you're going to do. So the two teams are, are sitting here with their map chart and they're they're using um, sometimes they might use actual models so we have a collection of some of these these little model just very simple metal uh, ships to kind of show the positions of where everybody's at and you can see how they're numbered so you can use those to refer to different squadrons or however you divide up your fleet um, so you can do that you can you know, show them on here, and, and they have tables that tell them how far each ship can move in a certain amount of time. Um, they've got things, uh, they keep track of things like fuel consumption. So in a small tactical level game, um, you're probably not going to be worried too much about tracking fuel. But if the game represents a scenario that happens over days or even weeks, then fuel is something you want to track because your ships might run out of gas. and <laughs> That can be a big problem. So this chart tells you, by looking at the graph here, you know, everybody starts out at 100. So they would have one of these for each ship that they're playing. And it starts out at the top here. And you can see here, this graph is telling you, at a certain speed, this is how you should be plotting your fuel consumption. So the faster you go, you can see how the fuel is going to exhaust itself much quicker. Um, so they're tracking that for, for each ship that they have. Uh, and they're going along here once they, uh, the, the time that's simulated. So you may be playing these in real time um, where uh, they would give you clocks to use. And so if the first, the first uh, move is, say, an hour long, then they'll physically, uh, this doesn't have the actual hands of the clock on it. But if you have the actual clock, you'll just move the, the hands of the clock to show how much time has passed. When they were playing larger scenarios, um, if they did want to play something that was supposed to represent, uh, you know, a multi-day scenario, you obviously don't want to have the players doing that in real time where they're actually in the game room for three or four days <laughs> playing it on a one-to-one -one scale. So the way they handled that is they gave them um, different uh, clock templates to use that were scaled up. So this one, the, the real, the clock time to real time is four to one. So um, each 
say. So what that means basically is each minute of real time that you're playing the game represents four minutes of, of game time uh, or of real time. So, so uh, or well, I should say that again. So one minute of real time equals four minutes of game time. That's what I'm going for. Um, so that's how you can play a longer, bigger scenario still in a reasonable amount of time and finish it and get something useful out of it. Um, these games did not generally have um, rules for how to win, uh, victory conditions, things like that. Um, that was pretty much up to the game director to decide when it was time to call the game. Um, sometimes they didn't, you know, they didn't really play to the point where there was a clear winner or somebody had come out ahead. If they were just playing it to prove a point or to practice a certain type of operation or maneuver, sometimes that was enough. So they didn't even bother trying to, you know, make a determination if somebody had won the game or not. Um, uh, but sometimes they could, you know, just do a simple tally of how many ships were sunk or total up all the damage that was done and then try to come up with something like that. But there wasn't a score, like they didn't keep track of any kind of points or, or uh, you know, other ways to determine victory. It was pretty much a judgment call based on the damage done in the game about uh, if you wanted to declare a winner or not. So, um, you want to do this? Yeah, <laughs> okay. So, done. Yeah, sure. Oh yeah, sorry. So. So uh, to figure out what has happened in the move. So once you turn in your move, um, the umpires are going to plot on their plot, you know, where other ships have moved. And then if you are close enough to see another ship or they tell you've detected a ship, you can write on your order that you're going to shoot. And, you know, they have a, a, a form that you fill out that says what type of weapon you're firing, how many rounds or how many missiles you're firing, which target you're shooting at, uh, to, and specify exactly what you want to have happen there. And so then to figure out what the result of all that is, they have a booklet full of tables. Um, and you can see here, this one is for specifically shooting at destroyers. So they have these for cruisers, aircraft carriers, you know, any other ship type that they might have in this scenario. They've got a chart made up um, that shows uh, over the top here, you're looking at what type of weapon you're firing. And then uh, you're going to cross-reference that on the side with the range to the target. And the number that you get in there is giving you um, a, a number that tells you how much damage is done. Now the, the judgment call part of this comes into sometimes with these games, um, in order to speed it up and to make play easier, they simply took that number and said, okay, that's the amount of damage you did. It was, it was a fixed number. So there was no chance, there was no randomness involved. It was just you knew exactly what would happen if you fired at a certain ship from a certain range. Um, if you didn't want everything to be necessarily predetermined, though, there were uh, allowances for using dice to modify that, that result. So that you might do a little bit more, a little bit less. Um, you could also have mishaps, um, like with missile launches, there was always a chance that the missile might malfunction. And so they might roll a die to determine if that were going to happen. So these particular games used, uh, believe it or not, a 20-sided die <laughs> to come up with that. Um, the strange thing, too, is that um, these were all based on basic 1 to 100 percentages. So even though there are 20 faces on this die, the results are really just you're rolling two dice and, and getting results from 1 to 10, and the first number being the tens digit, the second number being the, one, the, the ones digit. Um, so you would roll two dice, and if you got uh, a 9 and a 1, that was like a 91, uh, meaning if there was a 91% chance that something would happen, then you got it if you rolled anywhere from 1 to 91. Um, so each number is printed on here twice on a 20-sided die. So instead of using a 10-sided die, they included 20-sided dice and just had <laughs> the same result twice on the die. Um, so that's one way that they, they, they could uh, uh, introduce randomness and unpredictability into because they did want to you know, make these games very much uh, a tool for training people to think on their feet. So not knowing the result ahead of time and not knowing what could happen forces you to think on your feet and to come up with alternative plans when uh, you know, that missile doesn't fire or the gun, the, the shell doesn't hit the target or the torpedo malfunctions and it's a dud, anything like that. Um, so you go through these various tables. Um, there's another table here for uh, 
So this one is to a chance of if the shot has penetrated the ship, what chances are there that that will cause the ship to sink? So there's a table for that. There's tables for a lot of different things in here, but it's meant to be something that's very easy to reference and to look on here and to roll the die if you need to and then figure out the final result. Um, the umpires, again, are the ones doing that. The players are not doing that. They are just simply being told what happens in very general terms. So sometimes, um, you know, if you get, say, a chance hit on an enemy ship that happens to penetrate down to the engine room and it explodes and sinks the ship, um, they might just tell the other, say, other player that, uh, you know, you see one ship explode and it's not there. Um, but it's... Uh, obscured by a cloud of smoke or something like that and you don't necessarily know what has happened you know is it just damaged or is it actually out of you know sunk completely um, that that's more so the case I'd say when ships are just damaged and not sunk they might say well you can see that you did two hits on the ship but they are not going to tell you how much damage you caused to the ship only that you scored two hits so you don't necessarily know well I've got to get three more hits to sink it it's it's all part of that process of uh, training the players to think, how much firepower should I allocate to that one target, or should I shift to somebody else? There are a lot of unknowns they deal with. Cool. So let's hmm. um, now that we've kind of described what's on the table, can mm -hmm. we pivot to like continue to talk about over there, which is like a games in progress? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So this uh, in this case, we've got um, a, a kind of representation of one of these early tabletop games. Um, as it might be laid out in practice here, so you can see kind of what's what's going on. Um, some of the tools that they use to govern the movement of the ships that you can see here are are nice to have out. Um, so they they're using things that are pretty much like simple protractors and measuring tools to decide exactly how the ships can move. This one in here in particular is showing you. Um, and when a ship is going at a certain speed, which you see on the numbers there on each line, that's showing you how tight the ship can turn if it's making a turning movement. So the faster you're going, uh, the, the harder it is to turn. <laughs> it's basically the lesson there, and it's showing you. Um, you would use different tools um, that, again, are like protractors to measure the bearing to a target. Uh, most of the damage tables gave you a better chance to do damage if you are hitting the ship basically at more of a 90 degree angle and um, if you're hitting it more bow on or on the stern then you're going to be doing less damage because it's more of a glancing blow than a head-on shot um, for some of the uh now well, so i was going to look at these range sticks but those are for like the bigger the not these games those are used in like the bigger uh well here So yeah, and uh, for a tabletop game, they would have little measuring tape kind of devices that look just by like a measuring tape today to figure out the ranges for where they were firing at. For the larger games that were more um, uh, played on like a basketball-sized floor, they might have a range wand like this that's, that's almost like a, a souped-up yardstick or something much larger than that. And you can see the increments here that again have the ranges printed on them. So you can play a much, much bigger game with this. But the idea is the same. You're just basically have tools that let you measure ranges, measure angles um, for aircraft to measure height above the ocean or the water or the surface, wherever they're playing, to be able to figure out all of the modifiers that go into these tables to tell you what has happened when you're shooting at somebody. I'm going to put this back up before I break it. <laughs> so, yeah, this is just a nice, you know, uh, again, the sample of um, a simple wargaming kit that was used for to train officers uh, to think about potential battle ta tactics, tactical operational scenarios they might be involved in in a real-world situation. Um, it always kind of strikes me how how simple the tools are. Um, certainly they had computerized war games by now, um, not ones that were easy to pack up and take with them the way this is. So for these portable games, they're definitely paper, <laughs> little metal models, uh, uh, physical games that are easy to use. But um, the rules are certainly a little more complex, a little more detailed, there's more math involved. 
but um, at the end of the day, they're not that different from board games that you and I have probably paid. Things like Stratego and Risk or Battleship. They're, uh, they're, they're at that same kind of idea, but uh, certainly more detailed, more realistic, as realistic as they can make them. But um, it's just a simple tool that uh, the Navy uses to always kind of have officers in that mindset of thinking about what they would do in a real-world situation. And this is a very easy way to train them to do that.